switch it up on you this morning. Turn with me to the book of Luke. We're going to look at the book of Luke. We're going to be looking at chapter 15. We're really going to focus uh, first just on the first two verses and then kind of make our way down through uh, throughout the chapter. So Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you and we thank you, Father. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Father. I pray, God, that you would just quiet our hearts this moment, Father. Help us to put away the distractions of this world, and help us to focus in on your word. Father, help us to focus in and not listen just to, not to listen to my opinion on your word, Father. I don't need to add or take away from your word. Your word is enough. And Father, it speaks to us and it calls us and it draws us near to you. And pray, God, that that would happen this very moment, Father. And I pray, God, if there's one in here, That, Father, maybe they know about you. Maybe they have flirted with the idea of becoming a follower of you, but, Father, have not taken that step. Father, I pray that today would be the day, Father, whether they come forward, whether they, Father, if they interrupt in the middle, that's okay. Father, we just want them to come to you, Father. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this, uh, the scene that we're dealing with in Luke chapter 15, it's not uncommon for, um, for Jesus, number one, to have a crowd around him. Um, Jesus, it, whenever he would go, a, go to a place, he would demand, it, it just in his presence, it, there would be attention, both good and bad. There would be people that would cut, draw close to him to see a show, um, to, to be fed. There would be people that would draw close to him to try to get him to trip up or stumble on his words or try to get him um, to try to see him make a mistake. But oftentimes you would see that this is the narrative, that what we see in verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him. Um, I want you to take note that, um, that oftentimes they separate the tax collectors and the sinners because they put, a ca- uh, they put tax collectors in a whole other category right by themselves. They despise them that much. Um, so I have to ask this question, why were the lowest of the low so attracted to Jesus? Jesus didn't go in and try to promote himself. Jesus didn't go in. He didn't send people ahead of him saying, you know, get your tickets now. Jesus is coming. Uh, Come and see what he's going to do. See these amazing things. But but yet everywhere that he went, these people that were rejected, these people that would not be typically allowed to be anywhere close in the city or in the synagogues, they would risk it all to get close to. To this, uh, to this man named Jesus. We see it time after time. We see Zacchaeus that he was, uh, he was even to the point that he would, uh, as a grown man, try to look ridiculous enough to climb up a tree. And we see time and time the, the woman that, is, uh, that, was, uh, that had been bleeding for years that, was, uh, that would be considered to be unclean and wasn't allowed to be around people. She, would, she risked it all and snuck in there and even risking her life just to touch the hem of his garment. So why are the lowest of the lows so attracted to Jesus? Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, to hear him rather. First, first of all, he was the only rabbi that would have anything to do with them. He was the only one that would go and would actually teach them scripture. 
You see, because in that day, it wasn't just that you would go to your shelf at home and, and pull a scroll or a Bible out and be able to study it yourself. Why it was so important, and notice that when, when somebody had a disease or when somebody was considered unclean or the fear was to be put out of the synagogue, is they were literally cutting them off from the Word of God. They were saying, if you are unclean, or if you don't live the way, or, or you're not the way that we think you should be, you're going to be put out of the synagogue, and therefore you are, not, you are going to be cut off from the word of God. But yet you have Jesus that is coming, and he is teaching these people. He is teaching people about the word of God. He is teaching uh, people about the word because he is the word. And Jesus wouldn't only, uh, wouldn't only put up with them, but would actually teach and have an intimate conversation with them. Matthew 9.10, it says, And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. You've got to realize the significance of that passage because in the Bible setting, in the Bible, sitting down at a table and having a meal was very important and it was, an, it was a cultural thing. You see, when we sat down and, and when you would have a meal with somebody, it wasn't about the food that you're eating, but it was about the relationship that you were deepening, the relationships that you were forming. When you had a meal with somebody and you had somebody in your house or you were at somebody else's house, it was more than just eating. It was about choosing to have to do with those people. Amen. That's why it's so important. That's why when we have dinners, we still refer to them as a fellowship dinner because it's saying, you know what? I want to do life with you. I want to have to do with you. I want to get to know you. I want to be a part of your life. So that Jesus is reclining at the table and the tax collectors and the sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For a teacher that was well respected, for a teacher that was as knowledgeable as Jesus, surely he would, he would have known that this is not something that would be, would be accepted. But the thing that I love about Jesus is Jesus didn't care if it was accepted. Jesus didn't care if it was religious because Jesus knew what was right. Jesus wasn't worried about being popular among the religious. He was worried about carrying out the will of his father. So you have Jesus that was teaching in a way that no one had ever taught before. Realize that rabbis in that day, when they would come and they would teach in the synagogues, they would, they would come in the authority of the one that had taught them. So if I were to go and I were to teach and I were to say, well, you know what? I'm teaching under the authority, under the mentorship of Pastor Ennis. That would allow people to know, hey, this is who this rabbi came up under. And this is why we should listen to him because he's not just spouting off nonsense, but he was actually put some thought and was actually taught by this other rabbi. But notice Jesus come in no other authority other than his own because there is no one that can teach God. So he taught in a way that no one had ever taught before, and he taught with such authority. And yet here he is, and he's teaching, and he's having to do with the lowest of the low. He would speak with more authority than even the prophets, and yet here he is reclining at the table with sinners and tax collectors. He's not looking over his shoulder wondering, man, I wonder what people are thinking. He's not looking over his shoulder thinking that, man, this is really going to do good things for my public relations because they're going to see that he wasn't doing any of that, but he was just simply carrying out the will of his father. The religious community did not approve, to say the least. We see in Matthew 9, 11, it said, And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Man, I, I, I love, that's such a cowardly thing to do. 
They did not, they did not address Jesus directly. They go to his disciples, and you can almost see them kind of in the, in the, uh, in the corner kind of snickering and, and coming up with a plan. And they go to his disciples, and they say, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Oh, man, this is the attitude. and This has always been the attitude of the most religious people. Why do you have to do with sinners? Why aren't you more like me? Why aren't you close to God in the way that I am? And he goes, and in a cowardly way, they go to his disciples. They didn't ask Jesus, but Jesus was the one who gave them the answer. And if Jesus' purposes, in Jesus' purpose of his entire ministry, if we had to define it in one phrase, I believe that we find that in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You see, he wasn't saying that the Pharisees weren't sick, but they wouldn't acknowledge. You can go to the doctor and the doctor can run these tests and the doctor can set you down and say, you know what, I have some unfortunate news for you. You're really, really sick. The doctor cannot and will not force treatment upon you. And we would say if somebody was sitting down with a doctor and they say, you know what, unfortunately, the test came back and you're really, really sick. But the good news is we've got this we've got this new treatment and it's guaranteed it's going to heal you. It's going to cleanse you. And, and we're going to get you started on it right away. And he said, you know what, I feel fine. I don't I don't I don't believe it's not my truth that I'm sick and I don't believe you. So I'm going to walk out and I'm going to go and I'm going to live my life. We would say, well, that would be ridiculous. But every single day there are people that do that when they say the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, no, God, I don't want to submit to you. I don't want to admit my state of loss and sickness. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees that I've come to help those that realize that they need help. You can't help the self-righteous. You can't, you can't help those that say, well, you know what? I'm as close to God as I can ever be. You can't help those people. The rich young ruler. He couldn't be helped because he already thought he was righteous. Yeah. He just sought the verbal approval of Jesus. And when Jesus asked him, well, go and give everything you have. Jesus is asking, where is your heart at? Are you serving God? Are you serving money? Are you doing it to be a popular amongst your friends or to be righteous or because you want to somehow earn the favor of God? Or are you willing to count the cost? Are you willing to deny yourself? Yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. <clears throat> and just as this defined the ministry of Jesus, this should also define the ministry of Victory Baptist Church. Amen. We say struggling people helping struggling people. It's not righteous me up here. We will bend down and help you be more like us. It's saying, you know what? We all struggle and it's all by the grace of God. And but by the grace of God, go I. We're going to walk this thing out together. We're going to get in his word. We're going to listen to him. And you come to me. I'm going to show you him. And he's going to change you because I don't have the power or the capacity to save anybody. It's God who makes righteous. It's God God who paid the price. It's God who can cleanse you of sin. Not me. Not our congregation. Not our ministry. But it is God who saves. Sick people that were made well helping sick people that need to be made well. And when we go back to our passage this morning, we see a similar situation in Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. They still didn't directly talk to him. They just kind of grumbled. 
It's kind of like that one that sits in the corner and crosses their hands and I can't believe this. I can't believe that they would be like this. I can't believe that they would. Uh, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And instead of answering in just a phrase this time, Jesus begins to teach through parables. And if you go and you want to study this out and you, and you look at Luke chapter 15, this is where we get most of our parables strung one right after another, right after another, right after another. It's like Jesus was trying to prove a point. We're going to look at three this morning. We're not going to have a time to look into them very much in depth, but we're going, to, we're going to go over three. And I want you to keep this in mind. I want you to know the setting because we're not, we're not here. We're not about picking and choosing verses that make us feel good or that make us get it. Or Jesus didn't die to give us a better day. Jesus died to set us free Amen. and to change our lives. So when we look at the Bible, we're going to realize that these are not just feel-good stories that help you get through the night, but these are actual historical accounts that happen. So Jesus is sitting at this table. He's, he is, Jesus is sitting here, and these scribes are grumbling because he has tax collectors and sinners that are drawing close to hear him. Then Jesus goes on to say, he says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? I want you to know this morning that no matter how far away you are, Jesus will come for you and will bring you home. I'm so grateful that that's the kind of shepherd that he is because I was the lost sheep. I was the one that was going my own way that had gone into these troubled places that had gone away from the shepherd that had put myself out there that was that had no protection from the wolves of this world that had no protection from the weather or anything that was going on and my shepherd left the 99 and he came and he drew me to himself. And if God can extend His grace and His mercy to me, if He can leave the 99 and come and get me from the edge of the cliff of destruction, who in the world can He not save? Who can He not extend grace to or extend mercy to? He can save absolutely anyone. He goes on to say, he says, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And I want you to note in verse 7, just so I tell you that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. No matter how far, you are, how, how far you've gone, no matter how far you've run away, He'll come. He'll seek you. He'll pull you back. You say, well, you don't understand what I've done. I, I, I know that I'm guilty. You don't understand the, the thoughts that I think or the things that I carry out when nobody's around or the things that I look, like, look at. I don't know that, but he does. And he says, I choose you anyway. He'll come. And he'll rejoice. And he tells these Pharisees that I tell you that there are, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. They need repentance, but they're self-righteous. And in a church culture where ministries are often defined by numbers, Jesus understands the significance of just the one. Amen. Imagine that. Man, we, we, would like to, we would like people to talk and to say, man, there's, there's thousands that are, that are making professions of faith. They're doing baptisms every single week. But do you realize that if there's just one that comes, if there's just one, that heaven goes crazy. What an amazing thing. 
Who cares if we get the accolades of people? Who cares if we have people that are out there talking about what we're doing and praising us and saying that we've got to figure it out because if just one comes to repentance, that is more important than 99 self-righteous people that are just going through the motions. The significance of the one whose eternity is changed because of the faithful spreading of the gospel message. Yes, the gospel is for the billions, but the gospel is also just for the one. If only one through all if through all time, throughout all of history, if there would have been but one that would have accepted the price that God paid to deliver them from their sin and their shame, if it would have gone no further than the thief right there on the cross, he still would have went through all of it. He still would have done it all. He goes on to say in verse 7, just so I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over one do you realize when you came to know Christ that, that we, we, often, we often talk about our experience, but do you realize based on what Jesus is saying there, what was going on in heaven just when you came to Christ? Man, they all knew. They all knew. And that's the good news of the gospel, that no matter what you've done or where you're at or if you would just but turn to him, he would rescue you out of that right now. It's not about cleaning yourself up and then presenting yourself worthy. You're not worthy. And you say, well, you know what? That's bad news. No, that's good news because you can't make it. Because if I were to tell you that you can do this or do that to make yourself righteous, that's self-righteousness. There's no room for that. He doesn't need that. He needs for people to recognize the fallen, the fallen lost state that they're in and saying, I can't save myself. I need a savior. That's good news. And if we would but draw to him, he would rescue you right now. He will come after you because you're valuable to him. And you, may, you may be in here this morning and you may have zero value to those around you. Maybe you burnt every bridge that's possible. Maybe you've hurt and maybe you've maybe those uh, others have hurt you and maybe all of those relationships, all of the personal relationships that you've ever had in your entire life. Maybe you've just mutilated, mutilated them beyond repair. And maybe you have zero value to those around you, but you are extremely valuable to Jesus. He goes on to give us our next parable in, in verse 8. He says, Or what woman ha having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? He said, Well, God, God has saved all of these people throughout history, but you know what? He lights a lamp and he sweeps the floor and he's looking diligently for you to come to him. God's the only one that, 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 can, can, that can bring just great value to each and every one of us. And it says, and when she had found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors. This is such a funny thing to me because I, I just see this woman that she has these 10 silver coins. She loses one coin and she's, you can kind of see that she's sweeping and she's going and people are saying, what are you doing? You've got 10 coins, you know, eventually you might find it, but it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Why are you just, why are you so upset over this one coin? And then she says, you know, because I've got to find it. I've got, I, I don't want to lose it. And and then finally she finds it. And not only does she find it and is content with finding it, she calls and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
He has saved billions, but he is seeking you as though you're the only one. Right. Oh, it's so amazing. That's why we don't, we, don't, we don't need to promise things that God has not promised. We don't need to sugarcoat things that God, that, that, of God's word. It's enough. The, the, the almighty creator God seeks after you as though you're the only one. What can I add to that? What can I add to the offer? Say, well, he wants to make you rich. When you actually put into perspective what God has actually done for you, money, that's garbage. Keep it. Possessions, that's all going to fade away. But what he has done for you will never fade away. He chose us before we chose him. And he calls to us even when we run in the opposite direction. And then Jesus goes on to give us the example of the prodigal son. One of the most popular examples that we have. He goes on in verse 11 and he says, And he said that there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of, the, of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far off country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. We're going to pause right there for a moment. Many of you have heard this story, if not all of you have heard this parable, uh, but I want you to notice something. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into it. So when you come, if you have an inheritance coming to you, when do you get an inheritance? When somebody what? dies. Okay, so if you have a child that comes to you and says, you know what, dad, I, I, I want my inheritance now. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I wish you were dead. So you notice it wasn't just he was coming and say, dad, you know, I need to borrow some money or dad, I need to, I need to get some money and I'm going to try to go out on my own. But he's saying he, he comes and he demands his inheritance. He's saying, I wish you were dead, dad. And then the father honors what he wants. He goes ahead and he, and he splits out and he, he gives him his share of the property that's, that's coming to him. And, and it says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far off country. Some in here, you may have gone to a far off country. Maybe you grew up in church, maybe you come to church, but man, when you leave here, you're far off not doing the things of God, not honoring Him, not wanting a relationship with Him. But I want to stress to you that it's not about, it's not about uh, drawing to God so you can go to heaven when you die. He wants so much more than that. It's an intimate relationship with Him. I have been that person that I was in a far off country. I might as well have been a million miles away. And he took a journey to a far off country and he squandered his property in reckless living. He took his inheritance. He insulted his dad. He demanded his inheritance, telling his dad he wishes that he was dead. And he chooses wealth over one of the most important relationships in his life. It's hard to recover from that when you tell your dad that you wish, you wish he was dead and you, you want your inheritance. Basically he's saying, I don't, I don't want anything to do with you. In fact, give me the money and I'm gone. And he chooses stuff over his father. How many times do we choose stuff over our father? How many times do we choose things that are meaningless over a sweet relationship with a God who cares and a God who loves you and a God who pursues you? And reckless living. And he squanders it with reckless living. 
And what does that look like today? Well, reckless living is investing eternity into the temporary. There's so many people that they are, they are gambling their eternity onto things that are all going to pass away, that are all going to fade away. But then he finds himself in a place that we would we could all agree that he gets himself in a place where, yeah, he kind of deserves that. It's because we see in verse 14, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he, was, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I'm sure he had a bunch of friends when, he, when, his, po- when his pockets were full of money. I'm sure when he was out uh, buying everybody's drinks and buying people new things, he probably had friends for days. But now here it is, and that is how the world treats you, is everybody's around when things are going good. Everybody's around when you're down to have a good time. But then when all of a sudden you have nothing to offer them, they're all gone. It happens. It happened to me. Everybody was around when I was down for anything. Everybody was around when I would when I was offering to help them out or do whatever I I could do for them or when I was buying drinks or whatever the case may be. But then when that is no longer there, neither are they. And we would say, well, you know what? That's what he deserves. And we've got to be careful of this being our attitude, yeah. because oftentimes we may not say it out loud, but we set back and we see things that people go through and our attitude is, yeah, they're getting what yeah. they deserve. And, and indirectly what we're saying is, yeah, they deserve that, but praise God, I don't get what I deserve. Praise God that there were situations that I should have died. There were, there were situations that I should not have come out of. But praise God, he didn't give me what I deserve, but rather he gave me the inheritance of his son. We need to be reminded of this so the next time that we sit back and we see somebody where the bottom falls out and we say, well, they're getting what they deserve, but praise God, we haven't gotten what we deserve. We all deserve hell. We all deserve to be consciously punished for all of eternity. And as Christians, that should be our attitude. We should hope that no one gets what they deserve. That's why, we're, that's why we want to pour into the community. We, that's why we want to help people because we're struggling. We were sick. We were made well, and they are sick, and they can be made well. Mm-hmm. And it goes on in verse 17, but he came to himself. This is a picture of the drawing of the Holy Spirit when you come to yourself. I don't know that this was your experience, but this is my experience. It's almost like I came to a place that I'm like, what am I doing? What life am I living? This hasn't even been me. Like, why am I doing these things? I know that, that, I, that I, I act like I've, I've got joy. I'm acting like these are the things that I want to pursue and these are the things that I want, but they're making me miserable and they're, they're pulling me into a place of despair and I come to myself. That is the Holy Spirit asking you, what are you doing? Come to me. And he goes, and it's probably about that time that he's so hungry and he's desperate enough that he's going to eat with the pigs. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. You see, when, that, when the Holy Spirit draws you and you come to yourself, you get, a, you get an actual, a real dose of reality of what we deserve and who we actually are. 
See, before he, he was, when he goes and he demands his inheritance, he was saying in a sense, this is what I deserve. I deserve to have it now. I deserve to live a better life. I deserve to make my own decisions and not have to work to you and not have to bow to anyone. But then all of a sudden when it's all gone, he finds himself eating with the pigs. He's saying, you know what? I don't even deserve to be his son. I'm just going to go back and beg to see if I can be one of his servants. He got a big dose of reality. And then he comes up with a plan. We see this in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Based on what we deserve, we would be happy just to be one of God's hired hands. So you can almost see him, uh, and he decides to get up, and he decides to go home. He doesn't know what his father's response is, uh, is, and you can just almost feel the guilt and the shame that is coming over him because he's, he's finally realizing who he is, and he's, and he's starting to realize that I, how disrespectful I was to my dad, to the one that gave everything, to the one that took care of me, to the one that, that loved me more than anybody, no matter what. He doesn't know that he'll accept him. He doesn't know what's going to go on. So you can almost see as he gets up and he, 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 he starts to travel home. And he's almost, you can almost see him going over the speech in his head. Well, what if my dad says this? Well, I'm just going to lay it out there on the line. I'm just going to tell him, Dad, I don't want anything from you. I just want to be one of your servants. You can treat me as one of your servants. You don't have to love me anymore. You don't have to treat me as your son anymore. I understand that it just, I'll just be another servant, but just please put me back under the protection. Just please allow me to come back home, and I'll just be a servant. And you can almost sense the nervousness and the butterflies in his stomach as he's getting closer and closer. Well, you know what? I'm going to be home. It's going to be less than an hour. Okay, so I'm really going to, you know, maybe I'm just going to tell him. And what, if, what am I going to do if he says no? What am I going to do if he turns, turns me away? Because he has every right. But notice this. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And ran to embrace him and kissed him. He didn't even get the speech out. You know what that tells me? That tells me that we don't know how long he was gone. We don't know the, 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 the amount of time that he was gone. But his dad saw him a far way off. So to me, that tells me that his dad went out there every day to see if his son was coming home. That's what God does for you. No matter how far away you are, no matter all the bad choices, all of the sin, all of the shame, he comes out to the road every single day to see, I wonder if they're going to come home today. I wonder if I'm going to see them coming home today. And the sun would come up, the sun would go down, and there would be another day. Well, he didn't come home today. Well, what are you going to do tomorrow? I'm going to go back down to the road, and I'm going to see if he's going to come home today. And time after time, he would go to see if they were going to come home. And then finally, the day come. And while he was still afar off, notice the father did not make him grovel, did not make him beg, did not make him crawl to him. But yet the father ran and pursued him. That's what God does for you. When he promises that if you draw close to me, he's going to draw close to you. It's not like he'll back up a little bit. He'll make you do a little bit more. But when you start to draw close to him, when you come to your senses, when you come to yourself and you realize that I'm not even worthy to be your servant, he will run and he will pursue you with a reckless love. And he will run and he will embrace you and he will hug and he will kiss you because he will say, my son, my son was dead, but now he is alive. For my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and he began to celebrate. All of heaven celebrates over one sinner. God himself celebrates over one sinner. That should define our ministry. Who cares if anybody is like, man, Victory Baptist, they've got hundreds, they've got thousands, they're doing all of these things. Who cares because God gets fired up if one person is saved out of this ministry, and so should we. Have everybody bow your heads with me. Lord, we come to you. Father, we're so grateful, Father, that this is the kind of love that you pursue us with. The Father, I don't have to seek the acceptance of man because I've got the acceptance of the Almighty God. How, how much more free can I be? Father, we pray, God, I pray that if there's one that they're in this place, they're in a far off country, they have burned the bridges, they have, they have just, Father, they have zero value in personal relationships, Father. I pray, God, that you would help them see that you paid everything to get them back. And Father, I pray, God, that you would quiet our hearts this morning. Father, we pray for our pastor in the next service. We pray, God, that you would help us not only to listen and to agree, but, Father, to apply it to our lives. We're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful, Father, that you, you don't just allow us to stay to ourselves, Father, but you pursue us and that you call us. And that if we would but draw close to you, Father, that you will run to draw close to us. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.